Well, great to see you. I say Easter's almost upon us. Weather's changing. Uh, all sorts of news stories. There's one that's been happening this week. I'm sure some of you have seen this one with John Sentamu, the Archbishop of York. And uh, he was complaining that Ca- the National Trust and Cadbury's had dropped the Easter, you know, from their egg hunt competition around National Trust properties. Well, I'm not too sure, you know, I don't eat Easter eggs. It doesn't really affect me. Uh, I'm not too sure about that. As much as uh, eggs have become synonymous with uh, Easter over uh, past decades, actually as a symbol, you'll actually not find it anywhere in the Bible because the Bible wants us to look at something else. That's what I want to look at today. For instance, uh, what do Jennifer Aniston, Naomi Campbell, Robbie Williams, David Victoria Beckham, and the Pope all got in common? Right, they all were what? Crosses, okay. Bracelets, necklaces, even tattoos and things like that. A diamond encrusted cross, I've seen one of them wearing, and the Pope wears a wooden cross. Uh, It appears in recent years that the cross has become the must-have fashion accessory. But have you ever considered how odd that really is? I mean, the cross was an instrument of execution. Could you imagine if I had a nice big needle, you know, with a, a, you know, a, a, for a lethal injection around my neck, diamond encrusted, or um, a gallows, yeah, or a guillotine or something like that? Could you imagine, you know, it just wouldn't look quite right. And even the Romans who weren't known for being soft, they eventually actually thought the cross is just too bad. It's just uh, too a terrible way to kill any person. And by the fourth century, they banned crucifixions, banned that form of capital punishment by the cross. So the cross, however, is the logo for Christianity. Uh, We have been looking at some branding. We've kind of focused more on Living Hope than Living Hope Community Church and new graphics and stuff like that. And everybody has their opinion. But let's be honest. If you were to ask Joe Bloggs, you know, what what, what graphic, uh, what logo do you think would be good to uh, entice people to the local church? I don't think many would choose a cross. Do you think so? Because as the hymn says, it was an emblem of suffering and shame. But actually, it's where the Gospels all go. If you read Mark's Gospel, you'll discover that he is Mr. Quickly and immediately and suddenly, and they did this and they did that, because Mark wants to get to the cross, because everything is going to revolve around the cross of Jesus. And so, as we kick off this little Easter mini-series, I want to talk about how Easter changes everything. And today, I want to focus on the cross. Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, said this, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4, I passed on to you what was most important or of first importance, and what has also been passed on to me, that Christ died for our sins, just as the Scripture said. He was buried, he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scriptures said. The reality is, in churches like ours, Actually, you could have a service this morning. You could have programs galore all week. But the truth is maybe the cross might not get a mention. It is true. But for Paul and Apostle, he was saying, look, guys, we need to come back. This is of first importance. First importance. Probably the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that He gave. We're not just talking about the incarnation here. We're thinking about the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. That He gave His only begotten Son or His one and only Son that whoever would believe in Him wouldn't have to perish but would have everlasting life. So why did God go to these lengths? That's what I want to explore over the next while. So let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you that Jesus stepped across the cosmos, not just to be born in obscurity, but to die a very public and shameful death for us. And we pray that this morning, by your Holy Spirit, you would open our eyes to the wonder and the glory of the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, great news for every single one of us. You know, every single one of us have been born in the image of the Creator. 
And even though we may mess up, that actually doesn't uh, do anything negative about our value. Could you imagine if we found a, a Rembrandt that was covered in mud and filth and muck and stuff like that? No, you, you wouldn't throw it out, would you? No. You wouldn't take it to the local municipal site to see if somebody else wants to. No, you would take it to a master restorer because in spite of all that's been caked on top of it, you know that you have something of value. You have a great work of art. And it's the same is true in our lives. Nobody that we come across, not you, not me, is without great value. No matter the filth that we are currently presenting sometimes, you know, we're still valuable. God's in the business of restoration. But the, but the news is that we all have a problem. Here's what Paul says to the church in Rome. All have yeah, sinned yeah. and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Just uh, put up a hand if you sinned. Just, let me just see here. Okay, so, and the ones that haven't put up a hand, that's just pride. That's just, you know, if, if you say you've no sin, the truth isn't in you. You just are a big liar. Yes, so, okay, so all have sinned. And one of the things that happens uh, when we sin is, you know, often, I don't know about you, but we find it hard to say sorry. It's like if you have a car accident, you know, insurance companies, like we can make fun of bankers, no insurance company people here today, but um, insurance companies have you trained. If you have an accident, there's one thing we don't want you to say. We don't want you to admit any liability. We don't want you to say sorry. Uh, just simply say, not me, Gov, see my insurers. However, all of us, if, if we're honest, know that we are wrong. Yeah. So what does all have sinned mean? So I'm going to keep this really simple today. What does all have sinned mean? None of us like to think that we have messed up, that we have fallen short. Well, four things quickly about sin. First of all, you know, sin pollutes us. Pollution of our environment is still a major problem. As a fisherman, you know, it's really uh, grains on you, makes you angry when you uh, by a river and there's maybe been a spillage from uh, a factory or a spillage from a local farm and you see these dead fish you know, just floating uh, helplessly down, down the river. But the pollution of our souls is even, uh, is even worse. Look at what Jesus says, for from within, out of man's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these things come from inside and make a man unclean. Now, we may not have all of these presenting in one go, but the reality is that our lives are like scrambled eggs. You know, once everything, everything impacts everything else. And sin from within contaminates our lives. Every part's connected. Sin pollutes us. It stains us. Secondly, sin has power over us. You know, Jesus says anyone who sins is a, is a slave to sin. Now, it's easy to look at the heroin addict or, somebody, or the porn addict, whatever it is, and say, well, you know, they are uh, enslaved by this or they, by that. But actually, we all have things in our lives. The fact that most people every single year start off with a New Year's resolution, which is almost the same for most people, <laughs> I'm going to lose some weight, <laughs> actually is a bit of a sign that we are a Slave, that something actually has a grip on us. <laughs> that can be a simple thing like that. <laughs> but actually, other things in our lives. I'm slave to when somebody hurts me. I, that, uh, sin has power over me. I want to get even. I can't quickly forgive. You talk about the 10-second or the 30-second rule where you just kind of let it go within 10 or 30 seconds and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be offense-proof. But actually, the, we are a slave to sin, Yeah. And then thirdly, sin has a penalty. The wages of sin is death. Okay, sin has consequences. I know that they teach kids in school nowadays, everyone's a winner. Let me give you a little medal for coming last. <laughs> right. But the truth in God's kingdom is that there's a consequences for sin. The wages of sin is death. Love 
warns people. <laughs> You've kind of seen the hashtag love wins. Love warns as well. There are consequences to sin. You know, something in our very nature cries out for justice. Have you ever been in Marks and Spencer's car park and you've behaved yourself and the arrow says go this way and you go that way and you behave yourself and you prayed for the car parking space because God's got nothing better to do that day <laughs> than to answer your prayer for a car parking space. And, uh, and you get in and... But then you see... You know, maybe you kind of see somebody else kind of coming and you see the space two aisles over, but you say, I'm going to stick to the arrows. And they say, oh my God, see that guy there? He's just kind of going up the wrong way. You know, he's kind of he's kind of going against the flow and he's taking my space. Anybody ever? Yeah. But then the day you're, you know, you want him busted. You know, they'll have CCTV in here. You know, you want him busted. But then comes the day when you're late for meeting somebody and you could just quickly take a little shortcut and, and shimmy in. You see the other cars that they're playing the game properly, but you take a little shimmy. Sh There's something inside us that wants justice for others, but not for me. Yeah, we want others punished. We want others caught. But there are consequences, you know what, for all of us. There are consequences. The wages of sin is death. And then lastly, sin causes partition. It causes the division. When we mess up, there aren't just eternal consequences, spiritual death and separation from God, but there's actually a spiritual partition now listen to what the prophet Isaiah says. Your sins have hidden his face, God's face, from you so that he won't even hear. Now, if you have offended somebody or you fall out with somebody, you know, the last thing at times you want to do is get into that person's presence. I just don't want to even talk to you, Sally. You speak to that. Yeah. You understand, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the reality. Sin impacts relationships. Yeah. Persons hurt you, offend you. You ever been in Tesco and you kind of go, oh, there's that person there. How do we avoid them? You know, just me. You know? <laughs> but the truth is that sin has consequences in relationships. Yeah. And when we have hurt other people, we don't want to look them in the eye. We don't, oh, don't want to look them in the eye. And it's the same with God. Actually, because God is so holy, so other, so separate, that our sin actually causes a fracture in our relationship with God. Peter says that, you know, if a husband and wife aren't sweet together, guys, you better, <laughs> if you're not sweet and you're, you're, you're not being treating your wife correctly, actually, God isn't even going to hear your prayers. Yeah. It's just the way it is. God is wholly other, different, and sin causes a partition. Now, that's the bad news this morning. The problem is sin pollutes us, right? It enslaves us. Uh, there are consequences in the now and in eternity. And actually, it causes a breakdown in our relationship with Creator, right? In the beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned, it caused them to uh, have to leave the very presence of God, that place of blessing where God had put them in. Yeah, that was just a fraction of a relationship. But you know, Easter is good news. Yeah. Because of Easter, everything changes. I love what Peter says. Jesus personally carried our sins. We've talked about the black picture there. It's bleak, you know. But Jesus personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin. Okay, so we don't receive forgiveness and then just live like the devil. So that we can be dead to sin and alive to what is right. So when Jeffrey gets baptized at the end of the service this morning, he's going to go under the water, and that's like death. 
identifying with the death of Jesus. I'm going to be dead to sin, and then I'm going to live a brand new life, empowered by Jesus Christ. Okay. By His wounds, you are healed. That's the good news of Easter, right? We all stand without Easter before the judgment bar of God, and we have been condemned due to our sin. Sentence is passed. It's not a monetary fine. The wages of sin is death. Okay, spiritually dead, right? But the great news of Easter is rather than taking the punishment upon ourselves, the whole Easter story is that Jesus come and he's paid the price and he's taken the punishment for our sin on the cross. In 1941, a prisoner, actually, true story, uh, escaped from Auschwitz. And as a, rep as a reprisal, the prison guard said that another 10 prisoners would have to die in a concrete bunker. So the guards picked out 10 prisoners, but one of the men, a man called Francis, as he was picked out, said, look, please don't pick me. I'm married. I've got, I've got kids. He was feeble. And at that very moment, this other man came forward and he said, please, can I die? Can I go in Francis's place? He says, I'm a Catholic priest. Uh, I want to die for that man. I'm old. He's got a wife and children. I have no one. His name was Father Maximilian Colby. And so the commandant agreed, and the ten were put into the bunker, and they sang hymns, and actually they lived a lot longer. I think it was ten days to two weeks. Um, they lived a, a lot longer. Some of them had died, but others were... And in the end, actually, they killed them by lethal injection. Now, that's a true story, but what a sacrifice. And we kind of think, you know, and uh, within the Catholic tradition, they made him a saint, you know. But what a sacrifice. Yeah. And we think that's amazing, but look at the sacrifice of Jesus yeah. at Easter time. Far more amazing. Jesus died not just for one man, but for every single person in the world. You know, we've talked already this morning, crucifixion was barbaric. It was, it was hideous. Um, so bad, as I say, that that the Romans wouldn't allow any Roman citizen, no matter how bad a Roman citizen was, no matter what crime they committed, there was no way a citizen of Rome was going to be allowed to be crucified, okay? That's how bad it was. The physical torture, I'm not going to go into this morning, was only one aspect of what Jesus experienced on the cross for that. But worse for us was the spiritual aspect of the cross. Isaiah the prophet put it this way, he was pierced for our rebellion. Like when I've rebelled against the ways of God and done things my own way, Jesus was pierced for my rebellion. He was crushed for my sin. Do you know when we drink that wine and we eat that bread and we eat that bread is ripped apart, broken. And we drink that wine as those grapes have been crushed. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be made whole. He was whipped so that you and I could be healed. Yeah. And if you haven't seen Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, it's with those verses that the movie actually starts. It's a horrific way for anyone to die. Think of it this way. Instead of sin getting in the way of our relationship with God, it was given to Jesus so that nothing evermore would get in the way of our relationship with Him. So I just want to, in the closing minutes, look at why was Jesus crucified as we come into this Easter week. And the cross is like a diamond, right? You can preach a whole year of Sundays of what happened on the cross. It's like a diamond. It's got many facets. And I just want to look at four facets, very briefly, of what happened on the cross. And then by faith, I want us to appropriate each of those facets as we respond. Because it's by faith we receive the benefits of the cross. So we'll do that as we conclude this morning. And here's the first picture. The first picture of what happened on the cross. Think of the law court. Jesus was crucified so that we can have 
forgiveness, right? Jesus was crucified so that we could have forgiveness. Now think of the scene of the law court. Paul puts it this way, Romans 3, 24. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Paul says that through Christ's death we are justified. That's a legal term. It means that the penalty for our sins, when we talk about death, the penalty for our sins has been paid. Let me just tell you a little story to help you get your head around what this means for us. Think of a, two, of a story of two friends, two l- young lads. They grew up together in life, but then they go to their separate ways. One becomes a lawyer, eventually becomes a judge. The other one enters into a, a life of crime. And one day, years later, the one friend comes before the other friend. One is the defendant, the other are the judge. The evidence is crystal clear, right? The evidence is damning. As the friend appears before the judge, what are the judge's options? Well, the judge could, first of all, he could just let him go. That would be love without any justice. Or the judge could, secondly, impose the penalty, the full penalty. That would be justice without any love. But the judge employs a third. He pronounces the sentence and the fine. Then he takes off his robes and he goes down into the courtroom and he pays the fine on behalf of his friend. Justice is served, but love is demonstrated as the judge pays the penalty. And on the cross, that's exactly what happened to Jesus. Kendrick writes in his that great uh, hymn, Easter hymn. He talks about wrath and mercy meets, yeah? God is a God of justice, and God is a God of love, and pro- pronouncing us guilty, he sends Jesus to die on the cross so that we can walk in total forgiveness. Yeah. And we need to appropriate that, but we need to appropriate that by faith. Not partial forgiveness, to you know, walk in total forgiveness forgiveness. That's why Peter declared that on the day of Pentecost. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for forgiveness of sins. That comes through repentance. You walk in that forgiveness when you've turned. You can come from church and get maybe an encouraging message, who knows. You may get an encouraging message, but when you repent, actually you receive the forgiveness of the God and the river of the Holy Spirit that Rod referred to earlier. So the first picture, the first lens on why was Jesus crucified is that of the courtroom, of the courtroom, the law court. We're pronounced not guilty, we're forgiven. Okay, let's look at another lens. And this lens is the lens we are not very familiar with, but it was very common in Jesus' day, the lens of the slave market. And we can be freed. The difference that the cross makes is that we can be freed to really live. Paul puts it this way, Romans 3, we are justified, we've talked about this, freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. In those days, people were slaves for very many reasons. But one of the reasons why people were put into slavery was debt. That was the most common reason. And what they paid was a ransom to set the person free from their debt. They were redeemed, right? They were redeemed. In an interview with Lionel Richie, he tells the story how uh, he gave his dad this big, enormous present, and his dad just kept opening the present layer after layer, and he didn't seem to be getting anything. And eventually, he just came to this one piece of paper at the, at the bottom of it, and it said, all debts paid. His dad said, you mean my mortgage and credit card bill and Loans and all those things. And that's what Lionel Richie said. Yeah, everything, all debts paid. And that's what happened on the cross for you and for me. We were redeemed. All debts paid. Right. Take your credit card stuff to sell you. He'd love to sort that one out. But everything else, all debts paid. Yeah. We're no longer bound to things that 
have been so destructive. We are free to live for God, right? And so Jesus says in John 8 and 36, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed, yeah. And then we have another lens. Let me just look at another lens on the cross, and that is of the temple. Again, we are not familiar with the sacrifice and sacrificial system, but let me just quickly unpack that for us this morning because through that we have the slate wiped clean. So it says in Romans 3, 25, God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. So in the Old Testament, people brought their sacrifices to the temple, and as the blood of the animal was shed over the altar, they, uh, symbolically they had a new start. They had a clean sheet of paper they could start all over again. So for instance, at Passover time, they would slay a little lamb, the Passover lamb, and, and in many other ways it was as if the sin of the people was transferred as well to that animal. Well, some of you are old enough to remember the Watergate scandal. Chris is. He's not here this morning. He's uh, just going to PM tonight. But uh, Nixon, the U.S. president, had been impeached. They were having the hearings, and as part of the hearing, they were going to listen to this uh, conversation where it was alleged that Richard Nixon had actually incriminated himself on this tape. And when it came to playing the tape, they hit the button, but there was silence because Nixon's secretary had actually wiped the tape clean. If there was anything there, then the incriminating evidence was gone. And that's what happened at the cross, right? It's a picture of Jesus taking our sins, not just the punishment, but actually wiping us clean again. I mean, David picks up that picture, doesn't he, in the Psalm 51? He's, he's committed adultery with Bathsheba, remember? He's arranged for Uriah to be uh, killed. And it's one thing to be forgiven, but then you can be forgiven and then go through life just feeling guilty, yeah? yeah. But he talks about cleanse me, wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. And that's what, the, that's what God wants to do for you in and through the cross of Jesus. That will actually live a cleansed life. Not just knowing that we've been forgiven, but actually not having to revisit that and to walk in the cleansing of Jesus. That's why John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, looks at him and says, look, here comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he's picking up this picture in the temple of sacrifice of the Passover Lamb that they be cleansed through what Jesus did. And then lastly, the last picture actually that I just want to focus on, last facet of the cross this morning, is that of the home. That's a strange one to finish with. And that's about our relationship with God. This is what the cross is all about. Because Paul says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting our men's sins against them. God was in Christ. You know, perhaps for some friends that you'll meet or some people here this morning, you've been through hard times, you've been through suffering, and for you, that would be what you say is the stumbling block for you coming and putting your faith in Jesus Christ. But you need to know that our God is a God who is familiar with suffering. Right? God wasn't watching from a distance. Right? God was in Christ. Right? When, 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 when Christ is experiencing all of this whipping and and beating, and the sin of the world is put upon him. God is in Christ, right? Yeah. Not, not detached. The writer of Hebrews says that he knows how we feel, all the temptations, all the trials that we go through, that we have someone who's able to identify with us. And so this is all about a relationship with God being open again. And it's not just God reconciles us to himself, but actually he reconciles us into his family as well. The psalmist says that God places the lonely in families. 
And sometimes we have messed up so much big time that we kind of think there's no hope for me. Nobody, we isolate ourselves. We behave in certain ways. that will keep people at a distance. But God, through what Jesus has done on the cross, wants us to be reconciled to Him, but also reconciled to one another as well. Yeah. So in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19, we read, So now you Gentiles, I think everybody here is, Chris is a quarter Jew, but everybody else here is Gentile, yeah. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Different facets of what the cross, that's the cross is about. Why Easter changes absolutely everything. Why was Jesus crucified as we finished this morning? Well, we've all messed up. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Some people would say, what is the glory of God? I would say, who is the glory of God? Jesus is the glory of God. Right. Jesus is the glory of God. Uh, the standard is not the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments can show me how much I mess up. But actually, I look even higher than that. The glory of God is Jesus. And I haven't lived like Jesus. I haven't thought like Jesus. I haven't acted like Jesus. And every, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In comparison, my life, your life, just looks as if we're bumping along the ground in comparison to the sky's the limit, the glory of God. But the great news of why Easter changes everything is because of the cross. This is the first and most important thing. Right? At the cross, the penalty has been paid. Right? We can choose to beat ourselves up on earth and be eternally separated from God, but God wants us to live a different way. By faith, to appropriate what Jesus has done on the cross, the penalty has been paid. On the cross, the power of sin over us has been broken. We don't have to live enslaved to the, that cyclical pattern of destructive behavior. Thirdly, even the pollution of sin has been removed through what Jesus did on the cross. And the great news is that the partition has gone, right? The partition has gone, that God is reconciling us to himself. You know, I tried as a friend that fell out with me, and I wrote, <laughs> you know, a terrible, like, uh, two years ago I wrote him at Christmas time, and uh, I got a return to sender card. Can you imagine that? with a few little abusive notes on the back. <sighs> Some of us think that's the way that God would treat us. But God is in Christ reconciling the world yeah. to himself. You're not going to get a list of you did this, you did that. Jesus said, come to me, all your weary and burden. I will give you rest yeah god was in christ wreck destroying this distance you know what jesus did on the cross is a gift however it has to be received by faith e each aspect actually has to be received by faith when annette and i got married all our friends were getting married around the same time a couple of friends uh maybe you told this before gary and laurie got married in northern ireland the good thing about northern ireland culture is when you get married, listen carefully, church, because I've got four daughters, yeah. <laughs> when you get married, all your friends kid out your house for you. Yeah. Can I have an amen? <laughs> exactly, yeah. They kid everything out. I mean, everything, settees, bedroom. That's what they do. It's family. Church family does that for each other, yeah. Yeah, family does that. But, and actually, it gets, sometimes it gets so bad, that not bad, good, that you get doubles of stuff. You know, so they had doubles of, like, these kitchen jars, you know, coffee, tea, sugar. And they put them up in the roof space. And about nine months later, they uh, broke one of the jars in the kitchen. So they thought, uh, okay, well, we've got another one up the stairs. We'll get a nice new set, put it on the kitchen table. Right? And they went up there, and when they opened up the coffee, tea, and sugar jars, they thought, oh, there's something in this one. And it was a check from Michael's aunt for a grand that had been on cash. Banker, six-month rule for your checks. Could you just imagine the conversation? 
that they had saying, remember you wrote me the check nine months ago? I didn't, well, we, we hid it away up the stairs. And, didn't that and they couldn't, ca- they had to actually go to the aunt and say, can you rewrite us a check for a grand? Get back to the story of the two friends. In order for one friend to go free, the check had to be cashed. And likewise, the cross doesn't actually mean any benefit for us until we apply faith in what the Word says that Jesus did for us on the cross and we cash it, we cash it in. And so today we must choose whether to leave it or cash it in. <laughs> and I, equally for a lot of Christians, we can cash in part of the cross work but hold back on other aspects of the cross work. Look, I know a lot of people will say, in order for you to break free, you need to go to counseling, and you need to do this, and you need to do that. Counseling is good, eh? But the cross says something different. The message of the cross is foolishness for those. If I kind of said to you, the cross is your cure-all today, everybody outside of these four walls, including some inside these four walls, will think I'm stupid. But actually, from God's perspective, we who are being saved, It is the very power of God. Yeah. If I preach the cross, people's lives will be transformed. If I preach self-help, this is God's way. Easter changes absolutely everything. When Peter was having a barney with Jesus, no, don't do that. Don't do this here. Don't do it this way. No, no, not you, Jesus. And Jesus says, look, I need to teach you about the cross over again. Get behind me, Satan, right? We need to focus on the cross, yeah. Yeah, so today we need to have a fresh encounter at at Easter time. The cross will change everything. And just as the band comes, just in this song, I want us to respond. Because the penalty has been taken on the cross. That means we can live condemnation-free lives, right? There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Power, where we experience the power of God. Those cyclical patterns of behavior that have been destructive, it's at the cross where we find freedom. Pollution, right? Jesus makes us clean all that shame. You can't live in shame and flourish. Jesus wants you to live that way today. And then partition. You know, he wants the prodigals to come home. You think you've messed up. You think you've done something that God could never forgive. Today, he wants you to be reconciled to him, yeah? Yeah. Let's come before him. Let's embrace the cross today, yes. Let's embrace the cross, yes. Jesus, we we thank you for what you've done for us on the cross. We thank you that, oh my goodness, we can hardly comprehend, but your Father tells us this is the most important thing. And so today we don't want to kind of be like Gary and Laurie and hide away that gift, but we want to cash in every aspect of the cross today, yes. And we thank you that we can cash in as we apply faith to what you have done for us today, Jesus. 